Welcome to the fourth video in the Day of Datomic training series. In this video, Stu talks about how to get data out of Datomic. Stu starts with the two main ways to query Datomic, querying with data log and via the poll API. Stu also covers the raw indexes that underlie Datomic and how to apply filters. So we're going to look at four different ideas around getting data out. Data log query, which is logic, pull, which is hierarchical, raw indexes, which is getting access to the underlying stream, streams over data, and then filters, which is thinking about time. So uh, before we do that, though, I want to talk a little bit about the client API. The client API, as you've seen already, is async, so things are returned via channels. Um, if results have to be paginated, if you're getting back more than 10,000 things from something that can return a bunch of things, then the channel is going to come back with multiple uh, results in the channel rather than just one. So the, the single result channels are called promise channels. They're just going to give you one result, and then they're going to close. And if there's data to be paginated through, and I'll show you how to consume that data in just a second. Errors are going to come back as information. So they're going to come back as maps. Um, and the APIs where they can have pagination have offset, limit, chunk, and timeout, and they do what you think. Offset skips over the first results. Limit uh, says bring back only this many results before closing the channel. Chunk says how many results to bring back in a chunk. Uh, and timeout is how long on a per round trip basis uh, am I willing to wait before I'm going to get an interruption and not actually get it. And the important thing about processing, especially the multiple chunk results, is that they are transducible, which I'll show you what that means in a sec. So the basics are stuff you've seen already. You call client, some operation, the input. The argument uh, collection is almost always a map. Right? It, it's a set of keys that might be extended in the future, point to other things. Um, and then you do a blocking channel take. Well, you don't have to do a blocking channel take. You could be in a go loop. You could get things off the channel some other way. But we're sticking with that just to keep things simple today. In the very back, yes? Or are you just stretching? OK. Yes. So you can call pull inside of a query result. So in just a second, you'll see that you can make a query that returns 1,000 things, and then you can call pull inside the return expression for the query result, and then it'll pull for each query result. So here is a more uh, complete example. This is, so here I'm calling the raw index. So you haven't seen this yet. So client slash datums says, go and give me the raw index. I want to walk the index in EAVT order. I want to skip the first 10 items. I'm only willing to wait 60 seconds. Give them back to me 1,000 at a time. Limit me to 10,000. And then I'm going to transduce, async transduce the results. So what async transduce does, nope, phooey. I was hoping I had a laser pointer, but I don't. So what async transduce does is it takes, um, a something you want to build up. So this is the base value for my transduction. So transduction is like advanced reduction. Right? So my base value is a map. And for every chunk that comes back, I'm going to apply these two functions in the comp to the chunk before I add them to the reduction. So that's what transduce lets you do. It allows you to transform before you reduce. So it is a, how many people have looked at transducers before? Right? How many people have ever heard of MapReduce? Right? So MapReduce is like you go along, blah, 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 map and pile up a bunch of stuff, and then at the end, you reduce it all. Uh, transduce is you go along, and you're allowed to make these transformations along the way to the data that's coming in. So the data that's coming in is coming in um, 1,000 items a time at a time on the channel. But we don't know how many thousand there are going to be. Well, I guess we know that there's at no more than 10,000. So at most, we're going to get 10 chunks of stuff back. And we want to have a generic way to process those chunks without having to worry about the chunkiness. Right? How many people have had, had your life suck because you're using an API that you can do something all in one breath, and then you're forced to switch over to doing it in multiple breaths and sort of building up uh, the result? And transduce is designed to make that as clean as it can be made. And so what we're saying here is we're going to transduce over these results and we're going to transform each result first by calling halt win. Halt win 
is a transducing function that will immediately interrupt the transduction and just return the current value if it matches that predicate. So this is one reason why having things come back as data is valuable. Because now you can say, we're going to run along, we're going to transduce, and as soon as we hit an error, we're going to just get the error back, which will be a map instead of whatever it was we were looking for. Now, of course, you're probably going to ask me, well, what happens if I'm processing 100 chunks and I had an error on the 97th chunk? Did you really force me to throw away the first 96 chunks that were done? Maybe that could have been useful to me. And the answer is, I didn't. Halt win actually takes another argument, not shown here. So it has an additional arity that says, hand me back the results so far and the error, and let me decide what to return. So you could return something that says, well, you got this far trying to do your job, and then you know, something bad happened. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to map a frequency table on all the attribute values. So if you, think, if you picture this, we have 1,000 values in the chunk. All 1,000 of those things have an A. Right? They have an attribute value, which is the number that represents the attribute. We're going to call frequencies on that. That's going to produce a frequency table. The frequency table is going to take the form of a map. It's going to say attribute 74 had 10, and attribute 86 had 15, and so on and so forth. And those are going to total up to the number of things in the chunk, because every item in the chunk has some attribute. Then we are going to have the function that we use to complete, which is merge with. Well, merge with is a function built into Clojure's core library that will take two frequency tables and merge them, preserving the property that they're a frequency table. Right? That's what it does. Right? So merge with is a thing that, that combines, merge with plus combines frequency tables. That's what it does. So, uh, so what this is going to do is it's going to go through the data a chunk at a time, producing a frequency table, and then it's going to merge them all together. And this is going to tell me what my data looks like, shape-wise. It's going to tell me what attributes are present in my system. I'll tell you what I really want to do is write a transduction that goes to GraphViz. So what it does is it looks at the actual data in your system, and it starts drawing boxes for the different entities, and it infers that something is an entity when it sees that a lot of things in common have all these attributes. It draws arrows when it sees there are references between entities, and it makes things bigger or bolder or something um, when there's more of them. And then you could walk up to an existing system and say, um, give me an ERD, please, of what's actually in there. And just, and you're done. Yes? Should, no, the completing is a separate thing. So the, the, the composition is the transducer, and the completing partial merge with is the reducing fun. So this is the thing that combines all the results of the, of the transformed data. So let's talk about query. Uh, Datomic uses data log. And some people may think that's because we never, ever use the most common thing at Cognitect. <laughs> and so we heard that SQL is the most common thing, and we walked away. Uh, uh, but the actual reason is that the um, pattern matching style of data log, or one of the reasons, is that the pattern matching style of data log is a great fit for a universal schema. And you'll see that as we start to look at um, some examples. So we're going to do some queries against an example database that has only four datums in it. And we're going to ignore uh, transaction and assert retract for the moment. We're just going to look at entity attribute value. And we're going to query against this database. So queries are built up starting with data patterns. A data pattern is a tuple that both constrains results and bind variables, one or both. Um, if there's a constant in here, that's constraining the results. That says I'm only interested in things where the value is email. If there's a variable here, something that starts with a question mark, that says that's what I want to get back. So I would like to get back all the E's. And what am I naming my E's here? Customer. I want to get back all my V's, and I want to name them email. Right? That's what we're doing. Entity attribute value. So constants are going to limit results. Variables are going to be bound with those results. So if I say customer email email, if I have just that data pattern, then it's going to match the first two rows of this relation and not the next two, right? Because they don't match on the attribute. And customer is going to get bound to 42 and 43. Email is going to get bound to J Doe and Jane. With me so far? So, so question mark email, question mark customer are arbitrary. They are arbitrary names. 
And usually I'll make them like question mark C and question mark E just to be mean. But I was feeling nice when I made the slides. Yes, that's logic programming. Yep, here's some stuff I know, here's some stuff I don't know. Go tell me. That's great. That's exactly right. So the constants and the variables can appear anywhere. So this uh, uh, data pattern now is more constrained, right? It has constants in two positions and variables in only one position. And so if you put 42 email email up against that same four item database, it's only going to match one row now. It's only going to match one datum, and it's only going to bind email. We're not binding two variables anymore, so we're just going to get back JDO. You can also have variables anywhere. So you can say, tell me everything about customer 42. By, or Actually, this isn't really tell me everything. This is tell me the, all the attributes. Don't tell me what their values are. Right? So that would match email, orders, orders. And you're just going to get back some uh, Yes. That's right. Or you can say, give me back attributes and values. So this is really close to pull. Right? This is logic, but this is close to pull, because this is like, tell me everything, everything that I know immediately about 42. It's not transitive. It's not what does 42 relate to and relate to and relate to. But it's, tell me everything about 42. And so that would match three tuples. Email JDO, orders 107, orders 141. All of this level of data pattern matching, by the way, is set based. So if you go back here, even though it matches three rows, how many results are we going to get? Two, right? Because it's set based, orders are going to fold together. But the same query with more variables bound, now how many results are we going to get? Three results, because orders 107 and orders 141 are not going to fold together, right? Those tuples. Those two tuples no longer match where the one tuples did. Now, those. So in this example, they matched. In this example, there are three tuples email, orders, and orders. And orders matches orders. They're identical. So it's a set of tuples. It's a set of one tuples, one of which is email and the other of which is orders, because those last two fold together because they're the same everywhere. They're the same in every position in the tuple. Admittedly, there's only one position in the tuple. On this next one, however, there are two positions in the tuple. And by having more positions in the tuple, those rows which match in one position don't match in both positions. So now we're getting back three results. Is that true for new strings? Sure. So for example, in the value space, if, you, you know, if they're not references, but they're, they're just strings. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, everything is, everything is as um, unified as we can make it. That's absolutely true. So that data pattern appears in a where clause. And then you use a find clause to say which variable you want to return, which looks kind of dumb in this example, because how many variables are there to choose from? There's only one, right? So this is kind of a degenerate case. It's almost like, well, why are you telling me what to return? There's only one thing I could possibly return. But in a moment, we'll see queries that have more than one variable. And when that happens, you have choices to make. One, the, the um, things that come back are sets of tuples. And so this find clause specifies what order the variables will appear in in your results. Uh, and secondly, um, you might not return all the variables for reasons that we'll see. So how do you make a join? Well, in, in order to join in Datomic, all you have to do is mention the same variable name twice. If you have two data patterns and they both mention the same variable name, you get a join. This is a beautiful thing because it's extremely easy to reason about and write these queries compared to SQL, where in order to make joins happen, you have to name relations. Right? Why do we not have to name relations here? How many relations are there in Datomic? One. There's one relation of five tuples. There's one relation. In the SQL database, there's as many relations as there are tables. And in order to join things up, you have to name each relation on each side of the join. So queries have inputs. So this is actually showing the peer API, but it's the same with, I mean, you've already seen this you know, roughly. It's actually a map form with clients. So you pass in a database and the query that you want. You can also pass in an in clause. In clause is uh, sort of like, what do they call it in JDBC? Um, oh, my brain is going today. Um, parameterized query. So you want to pass in 
things that are bound already. So here I want to bind email on the way in. I don't want to write a different query every time I want to look up an email with email hard-coded. Why do I not want to do that? What's that? It's not reusable, right? Semantically, it's poor. And performance-wise, it's poor because Datomic, like every other database in the universe, compiles queries. And so you pay a little query compilation overhead the first time you use a query. And after that, those compiled results are cached, which means if you make 100 hard-coded queries or one query that's parameterized, then you have to compile 100 times instead of once. So you want to use parameterized queries. And in the in arguments, you can pass in the database argument. You can pass in the database argument more than once. <laughs> right? Why would you want to do that? Well, you could pass in the database at two different points in time. And then you could use query to join across two different points in time in the same database, which is more useful than you might think. Uh, although a lot of those use cases, you might end up just passing in the history database. So then you just have everything in one place. But you can do that. And so here's a parameterized query. So we're going to specify that I want to find the customers in database and email where, in that database, we look up customer, we hold email fixed, and then we find the email. And I'm passing in uh, jdoexample.com. Actually, I'm binding email. So notice that the in arguments here, I think this is just shown in the slides, actually. Uh, the first argument in the in clause database matches up with the first argument, db. And the second argument, email, matches up with the second argument. So we're binding the. Um, email on input, and then we're finding only customer. Right? So email is already known as of input time. And that's how parameterized query works. Now again, the syntax is, this is pure syntax. The syntax is slightly different in clients. It's async and, and all that. But it, it, semantically, it's no different. Yes? Right. So that's the syntactic difference. Right? That, the first argument there is under the query key, and the second, those two arguments go under the args key when you're in the client API. Does that make sense? What's that? Um, the indentation is, yes, it is one off. Let me fix that. Yes, database. Well, it's not called a variable name. It's called a database name. But yes, dollar sign means you're talking about a database. Question mark means you're talking about data. Yes. Yes. And how do you reference it? Do the join? So it could be like DB1, DB2, other DB, just like that. Yeah, so going forward in the slides, it's verbose to say dollar sign database. So it's idiomatic just to say dollar sign. And actually, that's implicit. And because it's implicit, you're actually allowed to leave it out wherever it's not ambiguous. So technically, every data pattern, every where pattern starts with a database, then entity attribute value. But most of the time, you leave out the database arg because you're passing in only one database. If it's not ambiguous, you don't have to say it. Mm -hmm. Yes, Francois. Uh, yes, it's all, it's all ordered. Okay. So the end parameters and the parameters that follow the query match up by order. When you look at it in the um, client form, you almost are like, you know, this could have just been a map. And that would be another way to do it. It didn't make as much sense in the peer API. But now in the client form, I wonder if it shouldn't just be a map. Because then it's more obvious how it matches up. Isn't it already that you can do queries as maps? You can do queries as maps, but you can't, you can't put the in clause in a map. And I'll tell, you what, I'll tell you the reason why the in clause is not in a map, because then you can't compile it. That's the reason it's not done that way. If the in clause was not part of the query, then it couldn't be compiled. Right? The, the, thing that is, the thing that's here, the find in where, that's the body of the query. That's the thing that gets compiled. And you don't want the, in, the actual inputs to be part of that, because then they can't be compiled. They're the part that varies. Right, so that's separate. That's why you can't do it. Syntactically, it might be nice, but you can't do it. Although we could pass in the inputs, you could name them again. 
down there just to remind you or something like that. But now I don't, now I don't want that feature as much. I just talked myself out of it. So don't vote for that one because I'm just going to can that one. So you can use predicates. And so uh, predicates are functional constraints. They're not logic. They're functional constraints. And they're applied after you already have matches in hand. Right? So once price is already bound, then prices will be removed if they don't match some predicate, if that predicate is part of the query. So this says that, that price has to be larger than 50. So we might have, at some point, we might have had 1,000 bindings of price, some of which were small and some of which were large. And then this will get imposed by query, and then the small ones will go away and will not actually appear in the final result. So this is a find the expensive items in the system. And now you're seeing a couple of things. So this says find all the items in the system, so all the entities item, who have a price which is price, and then keep only the expensive ones, and then return only the item IDs. So now you're seeing a scenario where you're using a predicate. You're also seeing a scenario where you have a variable that is not returned. It's just used because you want to do something with it. So I don't actually care about the price in this query for whatever reason. I don't care about the actual price, but I only want the ones that are expensive. So I'm using price, but then I'm forgetting about it when it's time to find. Your find is going to determine, determine what, what's returned. Right? Find is going to give you a set of tuples. And the number of things in find is going to be the size of each tuple. So in this case, we don't know how many we're going to get back, but we're going to get back one tuples that have item in them. And is there a limit on the number of things you can find? Um, I mean, you know, obviously there are some limits, but there are not programmatically imposed limits, right? You can't find a number of symbols that exceeds the memory of your available process to hold that number of symbols. But there's not, a, there's not a programmatic, like, sorry, you asked for 50 things, your hand is being slapped, or anything like that. What's that? You're only bound by the physics of the program, right? And how many things you asked to have back, and so forth. Um, well, you are bound in some other ways operationally, we'll talk about later. So we'll talk about, yeah, there, there are physics, right? But there are some physics things you, that you do care about when you're planning a system. All right, so the pull API. The pull API allows you to name things that you want to pull out. You can use wildcards to say, I just want everything. You can use reverse names, which says, find things that relate to me. Um, you can do nesting. So you can say, go and find this, and then in the nested thing, find that. You can specify defaults and limits to how much stuff you pull back. So here we have the pull API being applied against a little tiny database. So where we have a selector that says, um, uh, I want to find for Jane the names of things that Jane likes. So notice we're already, even in the most simple use here, well, it's not the most simple use, even in the first one I show you, we're already jumping to a nested selector. So this says, find the things that Jane likes and then finds their name. So what that's going to do is it's going to say, well, the name of Jane, that's a lookup ref. right? So, so presumably here, name is unique in this database. So that, that about matches 1,001. Then likes is going to find item 1002, and then we're going to use the nested pull expression to say, well, 1002, the name of that is broccoli. So this is going to return a map that has in it likes broccoli. Now, you can also go in the opposite direction. So anytime the local name of an attribute is preceded by an underscore, that is a syntactic trick that says navigate the relationship backwards. So this says, Find broccoli, right? Find the thing whose name is broccoli. That's entity at 1002 in this database. And then navigate the likes relationship backwards. So notice that we're not looking for 1002 likes something here. We're looking for 1002 is liked by something. I'm going the other way. And then we're finding the name of the person who likes pizza, which is Jane. This backwards navigation is a superpower. Right? It makes pull a lot more powerful. Right? It makes pull capable of really pulling back large stuff and wandering all over the database and going up and down and around and about. And it makes directionality not matter. How many people have worked in an environment where 
you model a relationship twice, once in one direction and, and once in the other direction to get the system to work. Or how many people have worked in an environment where navigating the relationship in one direction is cheap and navigating it in the other direction is expensive, so your modeling implies a choice about what matters, right? Because of this reverse navigation, and because, but what actually underlies the ability to do this, by the way? It's all physics. We talked about the actual, what the database stores. The ref index, right? The VAET index, the one that says you can efficiently go backwards, says that we can efficiently provide this, which means that you can navigate in both directions. This is strictly awesome compared to like being in an object-oriented environment where one direction is blessed, right? If I have a reference to you, then I can get to you. If you don't have a reference to me, then you, all you can do is search the universe, right? Search the universe and see if I can find somebody else who has a reference to me, which is not so great. But this is, this is super powerful because this opens up an entirely different style of programming against your database, which is you leave these pull expressions exposed all the way at the end user API. So somebody who needs to get information out of your system can decide what they need instead of you having to guess what they need and then be wrong and have them you know, not want to do it. And you can, let's say that you want to expose a subset of the power of these pull expressions, then you just write your own little parser that looks at the data structure in the pull expression and rejects anything you don't want to let them do, or whitelist in what you do want to let them do, or whatever. And you do that in your service before you let people pass it through to query, and then Bob's your uncle. OK. So that's pull. Um, and there's a bunch of, so reverse navigation is cool. Uh, there are, lots of, I guess the other stuff about pull we're not going to talk about because we don't have time. So we have a lot to do. What time is it? 4.15. We have a ton to do. All right. So quickly, you can navigate raw indexes. There are three different ways to do it. Datums, which just walks the full index starting with leading components. Index range, which allows you to get a specific range from a start to an end in the value index, so AVET. Um, and TX range, which allows you to walk the log, which is the basis behind that UI that lets us click around the transactions in the console. These all work conceptually pretty similarly. You can transduce over them, offset, chunk, limit, blah, blah, blah. Filters. Filters are applied to database values, and then those database values can be passed back to uh, query or back to the raw indexes or whatever. And filters are, in fact, filters. So these are predicates that just remove things. Because when you're actually talking to the database, it has everything in it. But when you say the default filter, the current state, that filters out everything that's been retracted. So it's just as it's returning stuff. And the way this works is really simple, right? As the stream of datums is being produced at the raw index level, it just filters out the ones that don't match. As of filters out new stuff. Since filters out old stuff. History filters out nothing. This does mean that for certain queries, it's going to be more efficient. Um, if you have an entity that has changed a lot, if you have a churny kind of entity, then there's going to be an open question of, is it more efficient to talk to the log and walk the time index to get it? Or is it more efficient to uh, look at the index, look at the entity filtered? Um, for most things, looking at the entity filtered is going to be much more efficient because the things don't change that much. Right, they're going to have some change, but they're not going to be like, I change every 30 seconds. And so here's an example. This um, sample database, um, is this one? In? I'm not sure if this is in the client example database yet or not. If it's not, I'll put it in tonight. This is a database about the uh, number of dilithium crystals that we have on hand. And the, the bars here separate different transactions. So in the beginning, we had 100 dilithium crystals. Then we set the number of dilithium crystals to 250. But because it was cardinality 1, the atomic automatically retracted the 100. Then we set the number of dilithium crystals down to 50. Then we set the number of uh, dilithium crystals up to 9,999, which, by the way, was a mistake. It was a data entry error. And then we set the number of dilithium crystals to 100. When you are looking at this database with a default filter, if you just walk up to a connection and say, give me the database, the retraction filter will filter out everything that's gray here. Right? The original value of 100 got retracted. The value of 250 was retracted later. The value of 50 was later retracted. And then the value of 9,999 was later retracted. So you'll see the current value, net of all that, all those item count values are filtered out except for the current one, which is 100. 
If instead you were looking at an as of filter, as of some transaction, then all of the more recent stuff is filtered out. So now you've wound back in time to the time at which, that's irritating, you've wound back in time to the time at which there were 250 of these. So you're ignoring the recent stuff. And filtered out the 100 before that. Well, right, because those were retracted. Right, because those retractions still matter too, right? And, and so if, if we look at the database as of this point in time, how many Dudley Hidden Crystals are there? 250, right? That's the current value. You also can look at the sense filter. So the sense filter is going to filter out old stuff, and then it's going to continue to filter out things that have been retracted since then. This is going to show you, so this filter is a little bit strange, because this filter is going to show you that there are 100 of what? Of something because you filtered out the name of it, because the name got added in the past. And so the moral of this story is when you're using the sense database, you'll often want to join it with another database, because some of the stuff in the distant past is usually like the names of things that you might actually care about. When you have that explicit filtering, uh, well, when you're using the default filter, or it looks like all of these filters, retraction, um, mask, Yep. Does that, does that mean it's walking that index always backward so that it could, for example, screen results to you? Because otherwise you'd have to wait until you, you'd have to hold on to the, you, you couldn't stream a value until you got to the end of the database to make sure it wasn't retracted. Right. So if the, if the data was internally stored in a naive way, you would have to look ahead to be able to do the right thing, which we don't do. Or, or start at the end and walk. Right. But you do have, to, so, so there's, there's a couple of things. Right, um, there, there are super naive models that have to look at everything. Right. There are naive models that have to look at least at what they have to look at. And then there are clever models that figure out ways to not even have to look at the things that you think they would have to look at, and we did the last one. Right, <laughs> right? and the clever model, and, and essentially the idea behind the clever model is every once in a while you run an indexing job that moves things that you know are filtered out completely somewhere else. And you don't look at that somewhere else unless you've backed up into a point in time where you have to. So there's, you know, you can do more advanced stuff. Yeah, you just, I mean, you can, you can, you know, I mean, this is the great thing about having a, yeah, you can, you can make some, you can get some stuff out of your way. And we've done a fair amount, maybe not everything you can do, but a fair amount of smart things uh, to make that more efficient. Then the history view obviously just has everything in it. There's no filtering of anything. So. And that's it. So yeah, so, so somebody asked earlier, you, you asked, I think, Francois, if you wanted to pull multiple things. So you can pull on the result of query and, and get back multiple things. And you might want to turn the batch size down then, right? Because that thing that's coming back is substantially bigger. So I could turn my chunk size down to something smaller, depending on you know, what I was doing. So the idea now is, and, and you can go back and actually play in the console as well, is to try to think of some things you'd like to ask of your own data uh, and use query to ask those. And we're going to take, how much time do we have? We're going to take, I can't get a, 4.30. So we're going to take 20 minutes. We'll resume at 4.45. And then I'm going to talk until about 5.30, because there's more stuff I want to say. I hope that's OK with everybody. Yay! Yeah. All right. So, so you have a few minutes to play around with query. And then we're going to come back and talk about operational characteristics of the atomic. And break. <laughs>